Hi there and welcome. This video is brought to you from opendoorchurchsunbury.com. If it's helpful, you can find more through our website and through our YouTube channel. Thank you for watching. The last few videos of mine, I've been looking through the first three chapters of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, looking at uh, how Paul one unpacks the things that God has done for us, his grace, how he has lifted us out of a life of moral failure, given us a whole new life through faith in him, how he brings people together, Jews and Gentiles, and therefore implicitly everybody in the world, how his plan is to unite everyone under the headship of Christ. And he's dwelt on some of the superlatives of God, his immense love, power, grace, and how he injects those things into our lives. And now in chapter four, Paul gets practical and he gets down to some of the nitty gritty of, in the light of all that, what, what does that ask of us? And what do we need to do in response? And in chapter four at the start, he, he comes up with four things, four practical things. And first he says, as a prisoner of the Lord, he's writing from, from jail, uh, not for any crime, but because he's been jailed as a Christian and for preaching Christ. And he says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. And in this verse, he's kind of harking back to the beginning of chapter two, where he talks about in the past, we used to live in transgressions and sins. In the past, we're always either falling short of the mark or overstepping the mark. Now, he says, it's time to step up to the mark. Paul appeals to us and he says, don't live down to your past, but live up to your future. Live a life worthy of the calling as citizens of the kingdom of God and children of God. In verse two, he says, be completely humble and gentle. He's writing to a, a Roman audience and in Roman culture, humility and gentleness were not regarded as positive attributes. They would be regarded rather like you know, a footballer displaying those in the middle of a football match. Oh, yes, of course, Mr. Ronaldo, please have a shot at goal. I probably couldn't stop you anyway. Yeah. That's, you wouldn't expect that in a competitive situation where everyone has signed up for the contest and knows exactly what it means. But the Romans lived the whole of life like that. It was all about, you know, keeping up appearances and pride, and I think I probably regarded themselves as a bit of a master race. And so they they didn't have a great view of humility, but Paul said, you, you know, confidence, and, and that is all very well in its place, but that's not for life. That's not for living. And he's just contemplated some of the superlatives of God in, in the previous chapter, the boundless riches, the limitless riches of Christ, the complex wisdom of God in chapter three, the, the glorious riches of his strength, his immeasurable power, his immense grace, love that surpasses knowledge, the immensity of God. If that doesn't humble you, well, how about stepping outside on a clear night and looking up at the sky and, the sky and contemplating all those billions of stars, each of them a, a sun of such immensity and power that we can't even really imagine or comprehend, and there's billions of them. Yet if all of that doesn't make you feel a bit small, to be honest, you haven't really grasped it. Go back and try again. Be humble, and it's not about you know, it's just recognising our place in the universe and our place under the immensity of an eternal and infinite God. Be humble and gentle. Just recognise who you are, who I am. Be patient, bearing with another, each another in love. The exhortation to bear with presupposes that there's something that needs to be born. You know, the Bible doesn't normally exhort us to do stuff that just comes naturally and we're going to do anyway. It exhorts us in the stuff that we feel hard, the stuff that that we don't necessarily want to do. And, you know, there are people, aren't there, who rub us up the wrong way. There are people who get on our nerves. There are people who we don't necessarily agree with. Paul says, 
if something needs to be born with, bear with it, just as other people bear with you, and you know, some of you bear with me, thank you very much, I need it. You know, no, they're not perfect, but neither am I, and neither are you. So bear with, in love. And then he says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. This is verses three to six. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and within all. Well, sorry, and in all. In all the, thing, all the things that really, really, really matter, God himself, the gospel, the means by which we are saved and brought into relationship with him and have our sins forgiven, his kingdom that he's established, God's spirit, his gospel. There's only one. <laughs> There's only one of those. You, sure, you can go shop around and find a God, a philosophy that suits you better, but they're not authentic. No other God has brings us than Jesus that promise of forgiveness and eternal life. No other God comes to us with the grace of the one true God. And so, therefore, keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort. Every effort. That's not, you know, <laughs> that doesn't leave any room for excuses. That doesn't room, leave any room for exceptions. Every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. And in, in what is the bond that achieves that? Interestingly, it's not <coughs> agreement. It's not attraction or affection. It's not even love, but it's the bond of peace. And that word bond, the Greek word, means a fastener, something that holds things together, like a button on, on, or a tie on a piece of clothing, a ligament that holds a bone to a muscle. The thing that holds the thing that drives us apart ultimately is conflict, and the thing that binds us together is peace. And so Paul is saying, yeah, you're going to have disagreements. Paul himself had disagreements. If you read his letters, he had several, but he always spoke respectfully of the people that he had disagreements with. And so, if you're going to get into discussions and debates and arguments, do it peaceably. If you're going to disagree, do it peaceably. If you're going to go separate ways, do it peaceably and in a spirit of unity and of love and of grace. And keep respect and speak well of each other. Never lose sight of the good that you know, brought us together, the good that made if a friendship sadly is broken as they sometimes are. Don't lose sight of the things that formed that friendship in the first place. They're still there and they are still valid. Sometimes it can be one thing, you know, that, that breaks a relationship and somehow that thing fills our vision and becomes the only thing that matters. And we lose sight of all the good in others and we cease to be peaceable and we cease to be gracious sometimes. And Paul was saying, make every effort, don't do that. Keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So let's, let's aim to do those things and God give us grace and strength. God give us grace and strength today to live lives worthy of our calling as citizens of your kingdom and as sons of God. God give us grace to be humble, to see ourselves not in just in relation to our own little bubble, but in relation to the universe that we're part of and the God who created it. God give us grace to bear with others, even when they perhaps irritate us and rub us up the wrong way, just as others bear with us. And God give us grace to be peaceable and maintain a spirit of unity between ourselves. Amen.